Hi, Jason Taco. Welcome to Beyond the Secrets of Painting. Today I'm going to be demonstrating a wildlife painting of a mountain goat. So I ask you to subscribe. Please sit back and enjoy this video and I look forward to your comments at the end. Okay, the first reference photo we're going to discuss is the mountain goat itself. Um, just a couple things about this photo. I do like his pose. I like the um, slightly turned away from the viewer, but with the head kind of turning back a little bit. I like the dramatic shad, or I'm sorry, lighting on his back, and that gives a nice interplay between light and shadow. Um, I plan to put him in a darker background so I can make that light, that backlighting kind of glow over him a little bit. Um, his face is mostly in shadow. Actually, it's totally in shadow, but that's not concerning me too much. One concern that I do have is of that um, big clump of hair on his side. That's going to have to go. That was left over from his, his winter coat, which is kind of surprising because this is photographed in early September and he still had leftover uh, winter coat from the previous winter. So anyway, um, some things are going to have to be done with this to make it better, but overall I think this is a good photo to work from. The next photo is of uh, some mountains that are kind of mid-range. Um, the peaks there you can see, I think this is nice dramatic uh, rock formations that um, will make for a nice kind of mid background if you will. This is going to be the darks I, behind the uh, mountain goat that I plan on using. And the next photo here, this is going to be used for some foreground reference for some rocks and things like that. I'm probably going to use that um, distant mountain back there. Uh, not too distant of course, but that mountain back there as um, kind of a mid-level mountain also to give some variety to the rock formations that we saw in the previous photo. And this final one, uh, this is just some additional reference, mostly for ground and also for background that I'm going to use. This is photographed in the same day at the same place but um, I think it's going to um, give me some additional information to work from. I'm probably going to make the grass more green as it shows here in this photo. I'm starting with an 11 by 14 inch tone linen panel. This is Klassen's, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, number 15 linen which I glued onto a hardboard panel using Miracle Muck. The tone of the linen is actually the paint remnants from a failed painting that I'd scraped off before it got too dry. I usually tone my canvas with a sienna color or some type of warm tone so that I have a middle value to work from. And that way I don't have to fill in every crevice between paint strokes. It gives you a lot more freedom and flexibility and looseness with your strokes. I sketched in rough outlines of the elements with white chalk. The white chalk is nice because it doesn't smudge like pencil or charcoal. I'm not talking about the kind of chalk that you use on chalkboards. It's actually an artist chalk. I believe it's made by Generals, but it is white. comes in compressed sticks. But you need to tone your canvas or your panel in a somewhat middle ground or darker color in order for the white chalk to show up. And the, canvas, or the paint on the canvas needs to be completely dry before you do that, of course. The sketch is pretty loose. At this point, I'm only concerned about the general anatomy and important features that will serve as anchor points for keeping all my proportions correct. The first color I'm blocking in are the darks of the mountains behind the um, mountain goat. These are the middle ground mountains. This is a combination of ultramarine blue, alizarin permanent, a little bit of yellow ochre to neutralize it, and a little bit of white. I'm keeping the paint very thin so that I can easily adjust it later. This dark value is ultra important for helping me to gauge the values of the mountain goat. Next is the shadow side of the goat. This color is a mixture of titanium white, yellow ochre, a lizard permanent, and some touches of ultramarine blue and viridian. Even though this paint has a lot of opaque white in it, 
I'm still trying to keep the paint as thin as possible without using any solvents or oils. This is accomplished by scrubbing the paint on very lightly with a bristle brush. The light part of the mountain goat is a mixture of titanium white with touches of yellow ochre, lemon yellow, and even some alizarin. Always avoid using pure white except on rare occasions. This paint is a little thicker since I'm very confident that the value and color are correct. Notice that at this very early stage I've already blocked in um, one of the darkest darks in the composition and the lightmost value of the painting. This is very important. It's going to help me gauge all my values from here on out. One of the things that you want to work on as you're developing your brush technique is to vary the pressure of the brush. Um, a lot of people when they start out they have a tendency to put the brush on pretty heavily to apply it pretty heavily to the canvas and basically use the same dynamic of pressure if you will for every brush stroke. Some artists might actually paint like that but if you learn to vary the pressure of the brush stroke um, you're going to get a lot more um, range if you will and a lot more variety in the way you can express your brush strokes. Okay now I'm adding more yellow ochre to the white mixture. This is to create the core area or purer color that will roll over into the shadow. This is the area where the sunlight is starting to fade out um, on the actual mountain goats and um, it rolls over into the shadow area. Usually right in this area, in this area of transition, you're going to have a purer, warmer color when you're dealing with warm light such as sunlight. At certain stages during the blocking, I like to scrape off any thicker paint that's on the canvas with a palette knife. This accomplishes several things. It removes stick paint so I can go over these areas later. It loosens up the outlines which gives me a greater sense of freedom and it creates interesting textures and edges. Any stiffness that I may have been feeling at this point is removed by this process. When I'm scraping off the thicker um, strokes of paint, especially the white paint, I'm very careful to remove any excess paint that I may have on the palette knife so I don't spread these into the dark areas above. Back to the bristle brush, I'm now refining the outline of the goat's back, adding and softening the paint as I go. This edge will be the strongest element in the painting most likely and I will want to make sure that it's correct. The face of the goat has a lot of blue skylight on it. This color is a mixture of titanium white and cobalt blue with a touch of alizarin and yellow ochre to tone down the intensity. These dark accents of yellow ochre mixed with transparent oxide red and touches of lemon yellow will help further define the form. The light mixture that I use for the back of the goat is carried down the leg. As I brush this light mixture into the dark of the background mountains, I'm applying the brush very lightly so as to pick up as little of the dark blue as possible. That dark blue is still wet, so I have to be very careful. I wipe the brush between the strokes so that I don't pollute the white mixture with the dark blue. So the process is basically like 
a couple strokes, then you wipe, a couple strokes, then you wipe. That'll help keep your mixtures very clean. Now I begin to brush in the grass and the rocks. The grass is a combination of yellow ochre, viridian, and cadmium yellow light with some touches of white. The cast shadow of the goat is a mixture of yellow ochre, viridian, and alizarin. The shadow side of the rocks are lightly brushed in. This is a mixture of alizarin, viridian, yellow ochre, and white with some touches of ultramarine blue and transparent oxide red. When quickly brushing in thin layers, many times I'll use the side edge of my brush and gently touch it to the linen using a quick back and forth motion. I let my brush dance around in a very loose manner. At this point, I only want to get a vague suggestion of the rocks in thin paint. This will allow me to add or remove certain rocks at a later point when I really zero in on the small aspects of the composition. Keeping everything loosely painted keeps me from feeling committed to something pre precisely painted that I may later find doesn't work. So in other words, if you're too careful at this point, you, know, you might be too scared to remove something if it doesn't work for the composition. So keep it loose, keep it vague, and that gives you a lot more freedom and flexibility. Now for the more distant mountains. These are a mixture of cobalt and titanium white with touches of alizarin. Once again, this is thinly painted so I can make adjustments later if needed. I decided that showing the distant mountain tops would also be too distracting, so I decided just to fill in the entire background with this color. I test a little green out and decide to use this as a grass color rather than the more o yellow ochre color. Both colors are up there, it just depends on the time of year. Now with the entire canvas almost covered, I'm going to scrape it once again with the palette knife. I'll also very lightly wave a paper towel over to loosen up the edges and shapes even more, making sure I use a different paper towel for the ground area than I use for the mountains. I want to keep these colors very clean. The lights of the rocks are painted with a mixture of white and yellow ochre with varying touches of alizarin, viridian, cadmium orange, and cobalt. Some of the thicker paint is scraped off. Once again, I don't want a passage of thick paint to commit me to leaving something I may not want later.
This blocking is possibly the most important part of the painting process. This is where all the elements are established in order to create a solid foundation for the rest of the painting. This is a stage where you want to examine your color and value relationships, your basic drawing issues, and your composition. If something is not right, this is the best time to identify and correct it. As we will see, some significant compositional decisions will be later made and abandoned. However, having a solid foundation to build upon is very important. Thank you for watching this video. I will be posting several more videos showing the detailed completion of this painting. Please subscribe by clicking below and join this new community of artists so that you don't miss any episodes. I also invite you to comment below with any questions or suggestions. Thanks again and I'll see you next time on Beyond the Secrets of Painting.